Hello everyone, my name is Melderon. Welcome to the Classic WoW Advanced Shaman Guide. In this guide we'll be covering stats, shocks, weapon buffs, spells and their coefficients, and advanced totem mechanics. Before we get started I'd like to thank Taladrill, Egregious, Navik, and my brother Defcamp for answering any questions I had while drafting this guide. I will also say this at the end of the video, the data that I collected is available in a shareable spreadsheet that I will provide a link into the description, as are the slides, so they'll also be available as a link in the description for you to download or comment on, and timestamps will be available in a pinned comment below so you can come back at your leisure, or if you want to just learn about certain topics, you should just click on that and go to the right slide. Alright, let's get started. First things first, let's go over stat contributions. So as you know in Classic WoW, there are a number of stats you can attain and accrue. There are Strength, Agility, Stamina, Intellect, and Spirit. Those are the five basic stats in Vanilla WoW. However, the way they interact with every class is different. So for Shaman, every one Strength equals two Attack Power. Every seven points of Strength equals 14 Attack Power, and 14 Attack Power equals one DPS. Something to keep in mind when you're gathering gear out in the world. And so Shaman can wield shields. Every 20 strength they get, they get one block value. This isn't block chance, this is damage that the shield blocks. So in this example here, I have the Seed Cloud Buckler. It has 11 block. So when you block with that, it will negate 11 melee damage. But if you have 20 strength, it will add one block value to that. So it will block 12. So that's how block value works. For every 20 points of agility a Shaman accrues, they get 1% melee crit and 1% dodge. Also, one agility equals two armor. We'll talk about that in a second. Stamina increases your hit points at a rate of 10 hit points per one point of stamina. One intellect will provide you 15 mana, and every 59.5 intellect you accrue, you'll gain one spell crit. Also, as a side, it also increases the rate at which you increase weapon skills. Finally, we have Spirit, which increases the mana regen inside of combat, as long as you abide the five second rule and not cast, and outside of combat. It also regens health as well. Okay, so let's go over how we calculate both spirit and armor on a shaman. So remember, mana can be regenerated both inside and outside of combat. Inside of combat, you have to be not casting for 5 seconds for that spirit to start kicking in. Health can only be regenerated outside of combat. So let's say you have 10 spirit. We want to calculate our mana regen. So if you see this little equation I have here in the box, the equation is 15 plus spirit divided by 5. Remember your uh, order of operations, do the what's inside the parentheses first, 10 divided by 5 is 2, 15 plus 2 is 17 mana. I won't go over each of these examples, that's just one. Armor is calculated with two variables. One, we need to know how much armor you have, and the second is the level of the enemy that's hitting you. So in this circumstance, we have 100 armor, and our enemy's level is 5. So we plug in 100 for armor in the equation above, and 5 for the attacker level in the equation. And you can run through this yourself, but what you can see is if you have the armor value and the level of your attacker, you can actually calculate how much physical damage you're mitigating. In this example, we have 11%. So that's pretty low, it's probably clothy, but if you ever wanted to know how to determine how damage mitigation is calculated via armor, this is how it's done. Okay, so now that we went over how we calculate strength and how much attack power we get from strength, let's talk about weapon upgrades for a second. So let's pretend you're an enhancement shaman, you're focusing on two-handers, and you are in Dire Maw and both of these items drop during your run. Which one's better? So initially, you look at both and you say, well, the Seeping Willow is great because it has higher DPS, right? It's 53.9 DPS. But what do we learn about strength two slides ago? Strength also equals DPS, okay? So the Wave Slicer has 26 strength. We multiply that by two to get the attack power, which is 52 attack power. We divide by 14 because every 14 attack power is one DPS. And we realize that the Wave Slicer has a bonus of 3.7 DPS via strength. So we add that to the total from the weapon itself and we have 53.4 DPS. So they're a lot closer than you thought. Also, Wave Slicer has a 1% chance to crit and that's huge if you're trying to proc Flurry. Enhancement Shaman want to have as much crit as possible. The Seeping Willow has an interesting proc and it also has a slower weapon speed so it has a higher top end. So you Wind Fury people out there might really like that. But all I want to say is that, you know, use the knowledge that you gain from this to know that even though something has lower item DPS, the strength bonus may make it a lot closer than you think. And plus also think about what your stat priorities are. I mean, I'll go over stat priorities in a different video. This is mostly about advanced tactics for Shaman, but always just consider all the available information in the tooltip before you make a decision. 
Okay, next let's go over hit caps and racial stat information. Getting hit cap is very important for end game if you're doing any kind of DPS, right? So if you're healing, this isn't important at all. But for those rare shaman who are not healing in end game, something to consider. If you're fighting a level 60 mob, and this is most of the trash you'll find in raids, a shaman cannot dual wield, so forget that there. And there is no ranged physical damage. So your one hand, your one hand plus shield, and your two hand, you need 5% hit in order to guarantee that you'll never miss and melee swing. Now the good news is if you get those three points in nature's guide, from resto you only have to get two more hit to be uh, hit capped for level 60 mob but for bosses which are technically level 63 you need to have 8.6 percent crit so you need a lot more and for your elemental shamans out there who are throwing lightning bolts at bosses and throwing lightning bolts at mobs for those level 60 only three percent crit that's easy you got it through uh, nature's guidance but if you want to never miss a boss, you need 16% crit, and that's a lot. So just to keep in mind. Also, a little tidbit about spells is that spells always have an inherent 1% chance to be resisted, and that can never be mitigated. Out of every 100 spells you cast, one of them will be missed, and you can't do anything about it. So just starting stats, and this is a vi this is easily available information, but just so you know, if you're run a roll of shaman, these are the starting stats that are available. Torin have 22 stamina, but they get that racial, so they have 5% extra. We know that 10 points of health every point, so that's 220 health. Well, add another 5% to that, and that's your starting. I think it's like 240 something ish. Also, something to keep in mind is that every class in Vanilla WoW adds bonuses to the starting stats, and shaman get plus one to every stat but agility. So if you're a troll shaman, you don't actually start out with 21 strength, you start out with 22 strength, and 22 stamina, and 17 intellect, and 22 spirit, just something to keep in mind. Below is your class and race level 60 base stats without any racial. So that's where you look at at level 60. If you ever want to do any kind of theory crafting, there's a list of your base level 60 stats before any kind of additions to health and mana via racials or racial uh, buffs. Now there's a lot more to go over here, guys. We can go over weapon skills, glancing blows, defense cap, armor cap, resistance cap. We can talk about this stuff all day. But Taladro has already created a guide for this stuff. And if you want to learn more about how stats work in Vanilla WoW or Classic WoW, head over to ClassicWoW.live, check out our guides, and check out the basic stat sheet guide written by Taladro. It's amazing. And there's a lot more you can learn there. So I highly recommend that. Okay, it's time to go over another topic that is very important when you consider playing a shaman since so much of our damage is from spells. Spell coefficients. So I have two pieces of gear here. One is the mantle of the Blackwing Cabal, another one is the Nightshade Spalders of Nature's Wrath. Which one gives the most spell power? So some of you may say, well, it's definitely the mantle because it gives 34 spell power. And some of you would say, no, it's the Nightshade Spalders because they give 29 spell power or nature, at least nature power, 29 of it all the time. And for those of you who say the all the time thing, why do you say that? It's probably because you see that up to 34 thing in the purple shoulders there. That up to is extremely poor wording. And it's not actually true in the in the respect that most people think it is in. All spell power from gear theoretically goes to your spells. All of it does. However, the spells interact, quote unquote, with that spell power in different ways. And they interact through what's called a spell coefficient. These spell coefficients are what dictates how much of the total spell power goes to the damage and healing of those spells. And there's so many different rules of how that works. It's just it's another 45 minute guide. Taladro's working on this as well. He's gonna go over how these things actually happen, how spell coefficients work. But the good news is I've done all the homework for the Shaman. So we'll go over that through the course of this video. Timed casts, so hard casts, quote unquote, channels, dots, instant casts, they all have different rules and they aren't universal. So some instant casts have different rules than other instant casts in the game. The only way to really test it is to do a bunch of replicates and see what the results are, and that's what I did for this guide. To go back, the reason why it says up to in the mantle of the Blackwing Cabal is not because there's some RNG behind the damage. Like, it's not rolling a dice and saying, well, you got only 25 spell power going to your spells. The reason it says up to is because of the coefficient thing. Depending on what spell you use, you may get 34 of that spell power, you may get 15 of it. It depends on the spell. That's why it says up to. So let's go over a basic calculation of spell coefficient. So this example comes from a hard cast. This is a spell that you click on, your character casts for a certain amount of time, and then casts the spell, okay? This is most of the spells in the game we think about. So let's use Healing Wave Rank 4 as an example. Now, the default, and that's a, probably a poor word, but I can't think of a better word for that. The default casting speed in Warcraft is 3.5 seconds. If a cast is 3.5 seconds long, it gets 100% of the bonus damage. So in that Blackwing Cabal example, that 39 damage, whatever it was, if the cast was 3.5 seconds long, it would get all of that power towards the spell we're casting. But Healing Wave Rank 4 and above is a 3 second cast. 
So if we divide the cast time by 3.5, so three divided by 3.5, we get 0.857. And now if you times that by 100, you get 85.7% or 86% rounded up. So healing wave, if it's a three second cast, only gets 86% of the bonus healing that you have on your gear. So an example is if you have 100 spell power, then healing wave only gets 85.7 spell power. Now something important to consider though, is that talents like improve healing wave, which reduces the casting time, does not affect that coefficient. So talents that reduce cast speeds don't handicap your spells further. You still get that same coefficient. Now this taking the cast time divided by 3.5 is generally a good way to determine the spell coefficient of a hard cast spell. However, there are exceptions to this. I won't go over that here, but Shaman seems to follow this theory. When I talk about Shaman to other people, especially Def Camp, or other people in general, I always talk about complexity and choice. And the way I look at Shaman, the reason I spend hours upon hours making guides like this is because it's choice upon choice, complexity upon complexity. So we have shocks, we have totems, we have weapon buffs, and we even get the talents yet, right? So there's, of course, every class has many, many choices and talents, perhaps some more than others, and Shaman are a good example of that. But there's so much complexity with when we're not even considering talents yet. Shocks, which share cooldowns. We have so many different types of totems per element type, which I went over in the totem guide. And then we have weapon buffs. We have four different weapon buffs. Which one do we use? When do we use it? These are some questions I want to answer. So before we get into spells, weapon buffs, and stuff like that, I want to talk about how I calculate DPME and HPME, since I'll be talking about these metrics a lot during this presentation. So DPME stands for damage per mana efficiency, and HPME is healing per mana efficiency. So these metrics are calculated to determine how much damage or healing you're getting per point of mana spent. And it's a very easy calculation. You just take the total damage and divide it by the mana cost. Now I know you're going to say some damages have a range or duration. So you take either take that total damage or take the average between the range and divide by the mana cost to get the DPME for those or HPME. Now the way the game's designed for 99% of spells and almost all the spells I've tested here except for one, DPME and HPME increases with spell rank. This is a common misconception floating around the internet that lower rank spells have higher HPMEs or DPMEs. That's not true. They just have lower mana costs. So if you have a lot of bonus healing, you may not need to cast high ranks of spells and that way you'll save mana. So that's why den ranking is so important. So let's use Earthshock rank seven for an example. It has a range of 542 to 573 damage and it costs 450 mana to cast. So let's calculate the average damage. So you just take the min and the max, add them together, divide by two, and you get an average of 557 damage. You take 557, divide by the mana cost, and you get 1.24. So you get 1.24 damage for every mana spent on average from Earthshock rank seven. Just keep this in mind as we go through the rest of the presentation. Spells with higher DP or HPME is just confer more bang for the buck, quote unquote. All right, so let's go over the first set of spells we'll be talking about in this presentation, the shocks. These are instant cast range attacks. They have 20 yard ranges from three different magical schools. That's interesting. So like a mage that have three different magical schools, so too do shaman. They have fire, nature, and frost damage that they can use. All the shocks are on the global cooldown, which means when you cast a shock, a 1.5 second global cooldown will elapse. Now, what's interesting about shocks, this is very unique, is that all shocks share the same six second cooldown, and that's six seconds of untalented. We can lower that with reverberation in the elemental tree. So if you cast flame shock, you then just can't cast earth shock right away. They all share the same cooldown. This is regardless of the rank used. So if you use a rank one earth shock to silence, it still incurs a six second cooldown. So if you're level 60 and use rank one, you're still getting that same cooldown. Now the effects that shocks have, like earth shock silences and frost shock slows, those work equally well regardless of rank. So earth shock rank one and frost shock rank one will silence and slow just as good as a high rank. So keep that in mind if you want to save some mana. Damage of these shocks is increased via spell power, not attack power or by talents, and critical strike chance is also spell-based, so either from intellect, spell crit, or from talents. And to the right are the talents that will affect shocks. Concussion will increase the damage by up to 5%, with 1% each rank. Convection will lower the mana cost by 10%, 2% each rank. Reverberation will reduce the cast time up to one second, 0.2 seconds per rank. And finally, Elemental Fury will increase the crit damage bonus from 50%, which is the base crit damage bonus for spells in Vanilla WoW, up to 100%, which is the same for melee crit. If you do 100 damage of Earth Shock and it crits, it would normally do 150 damage, but with this talent it does 200 damage. And all these talents are in the elemental tree. 
Let's start with Earthshock since this is the first shock you'll acquire at level 4. It is a nature spell. Does damage, interrupts the target if they are casting, and then silences that target for 2 seconds school wide. Meaning that, let's for example, if we silence a mage that is casting Frostbolt, it'll silence them from casting any more Frost spells for 2 seconds. Earthshock is also unique because it has a 2x threat modifier. Now most spells and abilities in Vanilla Well have a 1x threat modifier, meaning that they produce threat equal to the damage they produce. However, for Earthshock, this is not the case. It deals double threat. So this is very important for Shaman tanking. So if you're interested in Shaman tanking, you're interested in how threat works, I have both a Shaman tanking guide and a threat guide available on my channel. So check those out as well. Now the strengths is that Earthshock is a reliable interrupt on a short cooldown that can be shortened with reverberation. So it can be a five second cooldown. You can literally silence every six seconds, which is really, really powerful. It's also great for tanking, obviously. So it also has high burst damage potential, and you combo this with lightning spell. So the, the dream combination is lightning bolt, chain lightning, earth shock. There is some range issues there, but if you can get that off, those three spells together could be really, really you can really erase people from the game. Some weaknesses is that Earth Shock is the most mana expensive of the shocks. So if you want to silence and you don't care about damage, if you're in a raid or a dungeon and you just want to silence, use rank one. Same thing with PvP. If mana is an issue, you can silence a caster with rank one. Now, Earth Shock is affected by nature resistances, so if your target is nature resistant, it'll do less damage or will be immune to, to Earth Shock. And finally, it has high threat, so if you want to maximize damage in a dungeon setting, or if you're grouping with players out in the world, you may not want to use it, especially if you are, don't want aggro, so keep that in mind. I've calculated the DPMEs for each rank of Earthshock, as well as the spell coefficient. Earthshock gets 45% of any bonus damage that you have from gear. Next we have Flame Shock, which is a fire-based spell. It has an initial damage plus a dot over 12 seconds, which ticks every 3 seconds, so that means it ticks for a total of 4 times during that 12 second duration. Its strengths is that it's more total damage than any other shock up until level 58, when you get the highest rank of Frost Shock. However, during the AQ patch, during 1.9, when AQ 20 is available, the Tablet of Flame Shock rank 6 can drop, and you can get that, and then that will become the most total damage shock once you get that, but that's only available after AQ, you either have to run, run the raid or buy it in the auction house, the tablet that is. So another strength is that it's good for keeping stealthies out of stealth. If you have a rogue that opens up on you or a druid, make sure you get a flame shock on them, doesn't matter what rank it is, so that they can't re so if they do re-stealth, it'll bring them right back out again. Now what's interesting about flame shock, since it has a 12 second duration, you can flame shock, have it ticking on the target, and then when the six second cooldown elapses, you can throw in another shock, like Earth or Frost Shock, before you refresh Flame Shock again. This is for really long fights, mostly, obviously, and it's very mana intensive, but if you really want to burn something down quick, like an Elite you're trying to do for a quest, you might want to consider doing this rotation and squeeze in shocks in between Flame Shock refreshes. Flame Shock is the highest DPME if the full duration is achieved. If it's not, then the DPME, of course, drops off. So if you're going to use Flame Shock, make sure you get the full duration out of it. The weaknesses is that it's a waste of mana in short fights, obviously. It's not really good to use if you're fighting a short fight. Use another shock in that situation. It is affected by fire resistance, so it can be resisted or nullified by fire resistance. And the other crappy part about it is that rank 6 is only available after AQ opening, but it's still a good spell to use. I've calculated the DPMEs for each of the ranks, as well as the spell coefficients. So what's interesting is that the initial damage portion of Flame Shock has a different coefficient than the periodic damage. The initial damage gets about 15% of your spell power, and the periodic damage gets only 13%. Alright, let's move on to Frost Shock, which is a frost type spell. It is a damage plus a movement speed reduction of 50% on the target for 8 seconds. Now this movement speed reduction is subject to diminishing returns in PvP. So the first frost shock will be full, the next one will be half as long, the next one will be 75% shorter, and then it'll, the target will be immune. And this is in a 15 second window. So if you cast the first frost shock and 15 seconds goes by, the DR is reset. So the strengths of frost shock are that it's a reliable slow on a short cooldown. Now this slow does not stack with the slow from Frostbrand Weapon or Earthbind Totem. If you use Frostbrand, it's only 25% reduction. So if you want it a slower, you might want to consider using Earthbind or Frost Shock. Frost Shock and Earthbind have the same reduction of 50%. Now, Frost Shock is also more mana efficient than Earth Shock, and it has no additional threat. So if you're worried about that whole threat issue, Frost Shock may be a good substitute for Earth Shock whenever you're trying to do more of a bursty type damage or weave in between Flame Shocks. The weaknesses are that it's mana expensive. Not as mana expensive as Earth Shock, but it's still mana expensive. So if you want to just do a slow, a ranged slow, you want to use rank 1. And it's also affected by frost resistances, so if you're fighting a, a water elemental or something that has frost resistance, you may not want to use Frost Shock, of course. I've calculated DPMEs. 
And I've also calculated the spell coefficient, and Frost Shock receives 40% of any bonus damage you get from gear. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to talk about weapon buffs. And these are buffs that Shaman can put on their weapons to enhance them in some way. All the weapon buffs increase DPS, but they also can provide other mechanics. So Rockbiter and Frostbrand, for example, both do something else. Rockbiter increases threat per swing and Frostbranding has a chance of procking a slow. Now, each of the weapon buffs only has a five minute duration. So you have to make sure that you have some kind of add on or make a mental note that you have to keep refreshing it every five minutes. Now, these buffs remain on a weapon no matter what. You can't click them off. They can't be purged, they can't be dispelled, they can't be reduced, and you have to wait for it to either fall off of your weapon, or you can just enchant it with another enhancement. You can keep enchanting it with different enhancements throughout the course of a fight, there's no cooldown, as long as you have the mana to do it, you can do it. You can still put an enchant on your weapon, but you can't put on other weapon enhancements like sharpening stones or something like that. So if you want to enchant your weapon with Crusader or that plus weapon damage enchant, you can do that. But if you try to put a sharpening stone, it'll erase your shaman buff and vice versa. So if you have a sharpening stone on your weapon and you click on one of your shaman buffs, it'll erase the sharpening stone. Something to keep in mind if you're in a dungeon and you're dropping Wind Fury and the rogues seem a little confused about poisons, let them know they can't poison their main hand and have Wind Fury. They gotta have one or the other. And these weapon buffs are on the GCD, so when you cast one, a GCD will elapse. So just keep that in mind. Also, you may be thinking, well, I'll get Elemental Fury so I can increase the critical strike damage bonus of my magical enhancements like Flame Tongue and Frostbrand. That doesn't work, so don't do that. Also, you may think if you get improved weapon totems, you can increase your Flame Tongue damage by using the totem instead of the enhancement. That also doesn't work. Flame Tongue weapon will always do more damage than Flame Tongue totem, so just keep that in mind as well. Finally, let's imagine these four weapon buffs on this graphic that I've created here. So if you want consistency, you have two choices. You have Rockbiter, which is a physical damage enhancement, or a magical version, which is Flame Tongue. I consider these to be the more consistent ones. They have less variation in their damage output over time. Or if you want a variable one and roll the dice and see if you can get big numbers, the physical one would be Wind Fury, which has no magical effect added to it. And then we have Frostbrand, which is magical but is more of an RNG-based variable weapon enhancement. We'll talk about which ones are best to use in certain scenarios in a few slides. The first one we'll cover is Rockbiter Weapon. This is a physical damage enhancement. It increases melee attack power by a fixed amount increasing with each rank. It also produces a fixed amount of threat per swing. This is your Shaman Tanking Enhancement. The strengths are it's consistent physical damage increase, and it's not affected by any magical resistances. And of course, it's great for tanking and holding aggro. And its threat is increased in two ways. So you have a static damage increase from attack power, but you also have an additional threat per swing. So remember, most attacks in the game have a 1x threat multiplier. So since Rockbutter is increasing the damage of your white hit, it's also increasing its threat, but it's also increasing its threat with the additional effect. So I've calculated the additional effect in the table to the right. The additional threat per each swing is in the furthest column, and it increases with each rank, of course, up to 72 in rank 7. So if you want to know how much additional threat you're getting per swing, you multiply that number by your weapon speed and add the total damage of the hit to get your threat per swing. So an example will be, we use Rock Butter rank 1 on a weapon that has a 2.0 attack speed and hits for 10 damage. So 6 times the attack speed is 12, plus 10, which is the damage of the weapon. So 12 plus 10 is 22 threat on that swing. So it's, you know, it's a threat each swing. So you have to, so you have to calculate each time, of course. Luckily, the game does that for you. The weaknesses of Rockbiter Weapon are that it's poor against high armor targets. So if you have a target that has high armor, it's all physical. There's no magical portion of it. So the armor is going to absorb a part of all of that damage, not just... And Another bad thing is you really shouldn't use it in group content if you're not if you're not the tank or don't want to tank. Unfortunately, in Ragefire Chasm, in low-level dungeons where people are using Rockbiter a lot more frequently, you'll see the tanks have a really hard time because Shams are using Earthshock and Rockbiter. Well, it's really hard to hold aggro when Shams are using those two abilities, so just keep in mind that Rockbiter might be a tank's worst enemy. And since Rockbiter is physical, it has no spell coefficient. Let's move on to Flame Tongue, which is a magical damage enhancement. And this one adds static fire damage to each melee attack. And this damage scales with spell power, and its grit chance is spell based. Flame Tongue scales with weapon speed, which means it will incur more damage per swing the slower the weapon is. Its strengths are the fire portion ignores armor. So for higher armor targets, this may be a better choice. It also has high consistency. 
It's also potentially better if you're an elemental shaman, if you're stacking bonus spell damage gear. If you are, you may get a lot more out of it, considering that you may have to use it to finish off mobs after hitting them with lightning bolts. Weaknesses is, of course, it's affected by fire resistance, so if you're fighting a mob that is fire resistant, it will do less or no damage, and it does not benefit from any melee attack power or crit. So the white hit portion, of course, will benefit from the melee attack power or crit, but the flame tongue portion will not. I've calculated the minimum and maximum damage for each rank of flame tongue weapon, as well as the spell coefficient, and it receives 15% of any bonus damage that you have. Frost Brand Weapon is a magical damage enhancement as well. It has a chance to add a static frost damage bonus to each melee attack. And this also scales with spell power and spell crit. It also scales with weapon speed, but in a different way than Flame Tongue. Flame Tongue produces more static damage with the increase of weapon speed. Frost Brand has a higher chance to proc the slower the weapon speed. From my testing and other testing I found from other sources, the proc chance is about eight to nine times per minute, regardless of weapon speed. If it procs, it also reduces the movement speed of the target by 25%. Now remember, this does not stack with Earthbind or Frost Shock. If you implement Earthbind or Frost Shock, the slow will be 50% since Earthbind and Frost Shock have higher slows, but it won't be 75%. The strength of Frostbind is that the Frost procs ignore armor just in the same way Flame Tongue does, so it may be better for higher armor targets. It's a consistent slow if Earthbind Totem or Frost Shock are not available, meaning that if you have to use another Earth Totem and you have to use another Shock, you always have this as a way to slow your target. It also has intermediate burst potential. It isn't the most bursty of the weapon enhancements, but it definitely holds its own. This is also, just like Flame Tongue, potentially better for casters, as it does benefit from spell power and spell crit. The weaknesses are, is affected by Frost Resistance, so if you're fighting a Frost Resistant mob, you will not want to use it. It's inconsistent, meaning that you're not sure if it's going to proc or not. Finally, it does not benefit from melee attack power or crit. As with Flame Tongue, the white hit portion does benefit from attack power and melee crit, but the Frost Brand proc does not. I've calculated the plus damage for each of the ranks and the spell coefficient. Frost Brand receives more of your magical damage than Flame Tongue with a spell coefficient of 25%. Finally, everyone's favorite, Wind Fury Weapon. In full transparency, this is actually my least favorite Shaman Weapon Enhancement. It's a physical damage enhancement, has a 20% chance per swing to cause two additional attacks, and each of these two additional attacks will receive additional melee attack power that increases with rank. The strengths are that it has incredible burst potential, and I'll be the first to say, even though it's not my favorite enhancement, that seeing Wind Fury crits always makes my day. It has no internal cooldown in Classic WoW, meaning that each swing can potentially proc Wind Fury. However, Wind Fury cannot proc off of the additional hits that it produces. This used to be the case back in early vanilla, I think before patch 1.4, but this was fixed because that meant that theoretically Wind Fury can happen in a chain reaction and never stop. And I'm sure there were some salty people that were on the receiving end of something like that. Another strength is that if it does proc, those two additional hits if they crit, they can proc Flurry, which can kind of work synergistically to produce more Wind Furies. Now, the weakness is that it's, in my opinion, incredibly inconsistent. It never procs when you need it to, and I believe that Frost Brand is much more consistent compared to Wind Fury. Another weakness is that the additional hits it produces are not guaranteed to hit. They can be mitigated or missed. It's also poor against high armor targets, just like Rockbiter, in that all of its damage is physical. To the right, I've calculated the attack power bonuses for each rank. Also, there is no spell coefficient because Wind Fury is purely physical. So there's four options here. Which one's the best? Many of you are going to think that the answer lies within weapon speed, or there's a large group of you that just say Wind Fury and that's it because of the large crit potential. But the data I'm about to show you may contradict a lot of those points. But before we get into that, I want to show you the statistical method I used to analyze weapon buff data. I'm going to use an example, and you're probably going to think, you know, Meldoran's lost his mind. Why are there pictures of marathon runners and sumo wrestlers with an orc in a Warcraft presentation? But let me use this real-life example to kind of explain myself. So we have five runners on the left, and we have five sumo wrestlers on the right. If I asked you, is the average weight between these groups different? You'd probably all laugh at me and say, of course. I mean, marathon runners are running all the time. They probably have low fat, and the sumo wrestlers are intentionally eating to get themselves larger, fatter. Not to say they're not muscular, but they do that as part of their training. I have real data here. I have five runner's weights and I have five sumo wrestler's weights. You see those weight in the tables below. And this is actual data. And you'll see the green arrow and a red arrow. And those arrows represent the range of data or the spread of the data. And then I also calculate the averages. So we have 147.8 for runners and 
335.2 for sumo wrestlers. Now, it doesn't take an Einstein to realize that those are very different numbers, but that's not good enough for statistics and scientific experiments. We have to have a statistical basis to clearly state whether two groups are actually different and whether the averages are different. And the way we do that is by analyzing the variance or how much the data deviates from that mean and in what way it deviates. So that's called an analysis of variance or an ANOVA for short. So, do sumos and runners weigh different amounts? Looking at this data, you can see that, that it's overwhelmingly yes. In the box plot below, and what a box plot does is it lets you visualize the range of data. The runner is in brown and the sumos are in blue. And you'll notice that those box plots don't overlap. And you can see the ranges also don't overlap. I kept the same colors. I kept the green arrow and the red arrow to show you that their ranges are nowhere near each other. So there's weight on the y-axis, the vertical one going from 100 to 400. And then we have body type on the x. We separate runner and sumo. And those are very different from each other. So in science, a lot of times what we do is we put letters on top of the actual box plots. If the letters are the same, so let's pretend that runner and sumo were both A's, that means they're not different from each other. And usually I would put A and B. But since most of you guys probably don't look at these kind of graphs a lot, I put A and O which is the same thing, and I made it look like we're comparing apples to oranges, which is a saying in the United States that we say, if you're not comparing two things that are the same, we say you're comparing apples to oranges. So in this actual scenario with this actual data, we actually are. These things are very different from each other. But that's just a visual representation. What about the statistics? And in fact, those letters, A and O, are assigned because of a statistical test that I ran, not just because I thought they looked visually different from each other. So in that gray image to the right underneath uh, my favorite actor of all time, Nicolas Cage, which I'm being very facetious about that, you'll see I circled a, a number. That number is called a p-value. That number is 3.5e negative 06. And all that means is, is that that's 3.5 times 10 to the negative 6th power. That's a very, very small number. In scientific fields, if our p-value is below 0.05, we say that that result is significant. That is a very well used cutoff. So if it's below that number, we say that the two groups are different. Our number is 0.00000365. That is a very, very small p-value. And that just goes to show you how confident we are that these two groups are different. So the reason I'm showing you this is I'm gonna use the same approach to analyze Shaman Weapon Buff DPS as a function of weapon speed. So if you scour the internet and you type in which weapon buff should I use in Vanilla Well, or when should I use Flamesong, when should I use Rockbiter, when should I use Wind Fury, there are many, many Reddit posts, forum posts, guides that explain that the faster your weapon is, you should use Flametongue, the slower your weapon is, you should use Wind Fury or Rockbiter, because Flametongue scales better with faster weapons, and Rockbiter and Wind Fury scale with slower weapons. I'm here to tell you that that data and that conclusion is not accurate. My data shows that the weapon buffs were designed to scale with weapon speed at the same or near the same rate. Now I know you're gonna think I'm crazy and this is wrong and all these other things, but you have to realize that I did 560 independent tests to test this. I did 140 tests within each weapon buff across 28 different weapon speeds. And I did five replicates per speed. And what I'm showing you here is that we have DPS on the Y, we have each of the weapon enhancements on the X. Look at the spreads, look how much they overlap. Remember that sumo wrestler versus runner? comparison I showed you, each of these variances overlap. The green arrows show that, and the p-values in the top right were at a 0.19. That is not significant at all. It's not even close. And this is averaged across all weapon speeds. Also, those tiny little red bars inside the green arrows show you Rock Biter, which is the most consistent compared to the all other weapon buffs. You'll notice that the green double arrow next to Rock Biter, there's a small red bar inside. That's the Rock Biter consistency spread. And I copy that to all the other weapon buffs to show you that Flame Tongue is a little bit less consistent, but Frostbrand and Wind Fury are much less consistent. They're more of the variable weapon buffs and have the largest spread. What this data shows is that it doesn't matter which weapon buff you use, at least over the long term. Of course, there's going to be certain scenarios where one weapon buff will be better than the other. Now, I use the highest rank of weapon buff to test this because it's very hard to say which rank of Rockbiter compares to which rank of Flame Tongue. So I'm assuming that the highest rank should be the best for comparison purposes because it's the highest rank available. So that was data that's averaged across all weapon speeds. Now let's look within weapon speeds. Now this looks like a very busy plot, but let me explain what's happening here. Weapon speed is on the x-axis, going from 1.3, which is the fastest weapon you can get as a shaman, up to 4.0, which is the slowest. And on the y-axis is DPS. Each of the colored lines represent a different weapon buff. Green is Rockbiter, the red-orange is Flametongue, light blue is Frostbrand, and purple is Wind Fury. 
do not look at the change in DPS over the course of weapon speed. That is not what I'm testing here. The reason why I use the line chart like this is because imagine showing you guys 28 different box plots. It's just too much. If you see a change in DPS, like the shift you see between weapon speed 2.9 and 3.0, that is because I tried my hardest to use weapons in each of those tests that were around the same DPS. It's a lot harder than you think to craft a test with the same exact DPS each time. Weapon DPSs are variable and so are their bonuses, so it's hard to normalize DPS over 28 different weapon speeds. I did my best, but what you are looking for are within the dotted lines. Those are the weapon speed comparisons, and you're looking at the spread between the four black dots or the four colored lines, whatever we're gonna look at it. Let's look at like 1.3 weapon speed, which is this fastest. You'll see that I drew that little blue bracket and that shows the range of the difference in DPS. It's only about five DPS difference across all of those weapon buffs. And five DPS at level 60, the level of my character I use to do this analysis is very small. Now we went over these ANOVA things. I did an ANOVA for each of those 28 different weapon speeds and none of them came out significant. So there is no statistical significant difference for each weapon buff DPS in all of those weapon speeds. And there are two other big results we can take out of this. So I talked about ranges and I said 1.3, it's about a five DPS range between top and bottom. The average range across all weapon speeds is only 4.8 DPS, very, very small amount. And what's even more interesting is that there are no detectable trends. Flame Tongue doesn't get worse as weapon speed increases and Rock Biter doesn't get better and Wind Fury doesn't get better. They're all about the same. They switch up and down for which one's better and which one's worse. And if I do this a hundred more times, it's gonna just get more converged. These values are converging. It goes to show these weapon buffs are designed to create player choice and are designed to scale relatively the same way. So those are pretty interesting results in my opinion and really shattered my preconceived notions of these weapon buffs. And this all started by Def Camp and I dueling. I just let him hit me and I noticed that the DPSs were so close for Flame Tongue and Rockbiter and Frostbrand. So literally just dueling made me do this test. And I just wanna say that don't take things for face value when you hear them. If you hear something, don't just say, okay, that's gotta be how it is. Go out and test it. And I have to teach myself that as well. I should have done that a long time ago, but I'm glad I did it now. And I want to thank Def Camp for bringing this up. Now, the raw data I use to do these analyses, the weapon buff times, and also the spell coefficients, all that data will be available in the description in a Google Sheets. So if you want to look at this data yourself, you can do that. So let's go over some previous results I've already showed. So this may either corroborate or go against what I've showed in previous leveling videos. And my Shaman Leveling Guide Part 1 actually did a similar test with Flame Tongue versus Wind Fury. And even though Wind Fury did more total damage, the difference was not significant. So that actually corroborates what I just showed you in the previous slide. However, in Shaman Leveling Guide Part 2, I did Time to Kill, 20 Hippogriffs with a bunch of different builds and weapon enhancements. And you'll see that like hybrid Wind Fury weapon and hybrid Flame Tongue weapon, hybrid Wind Fury was faster than Flame Tongue. But this was only one replicate, and I'm in the process of fixing that. I'm in the process of doing another leveling guide where I'll be doing five replicates for time to kill, and I'll see really then if the differences actually come out. So I'm eager to see how that comes out. I would take my part two analysis where I'm showing the, the kill times with a grain of salt. Now I wouldn't do that for builds, so I wouldn't do that for elemental versus hybrid, but I would do it perhaps within hybrid, Flame Tongue versus Wind Fury. There's just too much noise that can happen in one replicate and I'm probably capturing too much variation. So I just wanted to go over some previous results and how these new data interact with my old data. Okay, so if weapon buff doesn't matter, what does matter? And there are seven things to take into consideration when you use a certain weapon buff. And the first is armor class. Remember, if you're going against a high armor target, you want to use those magical weapon buffs like Flame Tongue and Frostbrand because that magical damage bypasses armor. The next thing you have to consider is time of engagement. How long are you gonna be fighting? And if it's a PVP situation or you're duo leveling where mobs are dying really quick or in PVP where you wanna just put up some burst damage, you're gonna put on Wind Fury or Frostbrand, right? You wanna see if you can get those Wind Fury crits. The shorter the engagement time, the more variation can be captured. It's like I said with that whole thing, the previous slide, I only did one replicate and I was probably capturing too much variation. Well, variation can occur in short time spans. So you may put on Wind Fury and engage with someone and kill them in three seconds, right? Do you wanna roll the dice? Do you wanna have a consistency? 
And also think about interaction with other abilities, like Flurry is a good example. In the test I used, I didn't use any talents, so I didn't put talents in Flurry. However, Wind Fury can work synergistically with Flurry. I don't think it's going to make a difference over the course of your leveling. I think it, everything will even out in the end. But in shorter fights or in PvP skirmishes, remember that Wind Fury procs, the additional hits that proc off of Wind Fury can also proc Flurry. So you could have more Flurry chances with Wind Fury. The next thing to consider, are you soloing or in a party? If you're by yourself, Rockbiter can be used. You're not worrying about pulling threat off someone, and Rockbiter is very consistent. It's the most consistent weapon buff I tested. Also, if you're tanking, you're going to use Rockbiter. So what's what's the role you're playing, right? And Frostbrand's great if mobs are going to run a lot. It doesn't cost any additional mana once you put Frostbrand on your target, right? So the chance of it procking will slow your targets down. And those pesky mobs that like to run away, instead of wasting all that mana on a Frost Shock or sacrificing your Earth Totem for an Earth Bind, you can use Frostbrand instead. The next, are you an Elemental Shaman? Are you stacking Spell Power and Crit? If you are, the magical buffs will probably be better for you because they'll do more damage. Something that I did not take into consideration for this test is spell power. Since most shaman are going to level enhancement, I don't think taking spell power over strength of agility is worth it. It's not that much of a difference, but since you're already stacking it anyway as elemental, it may be better to use as weapon buffs if you're an elemental shaman. Next are resistances. You're not going to go use flame tongue against a fire elemental. You're going to use another one. Keep in the consideration that resistances are a thing. So if you're worried about resistances, use one of the physical damage ones like wind fury or rock biter. Or if you're not going against someone, that has any kind of resistance you can use the magical buffs number six this is purely theoretical which buff was the most recently trained since i showed that at max rank it doesn't matter it may matter during the leveling process what i mean by that is you may get rock biter and then two or four levels later you get a new flame tongue that flame tongue may do more total damage than the rock biter you just got i'm not sure if that's true but if you have nothing to lose you might as well give it a shot and try it and last but not least perhaps the most important thing what is your personal preference do you like rolling the dice do you like seeing big hits or do you like consistency do you like seeing that extra little fire damage tick or do you like seeing your enemy turn blue and slow down when frost brand procs maybe you just like the color of the frost brand animation on your weapon it really comes down to personal preference at the end of the day and this data shows that you can use what you want so do that. Okay, now let's move on to lightning spells. We talked about weapon buffs, we talked about shocks. Another core part of the shaman's DPS toolbox comes in the form of lightning spells. This includes lightning bolt, chain lightning, but it also includes, let's not forget, lightning shield. Now all of these belong to the nature school and will do nature damage. And the damage of these spells can be increased via spell power and talents. Also, Critical Strike is spell-based, either coming from intellect, spell crit, or talents, except lightning shield, which cannot crit. If you're an elemental shaman, lightning bolt and chain lightning are your bread and butter for sure. Now all these talents here will affect both your lightning bolt and your chain lightning spells. We can increase our critical strike via call thunder elemental fury. We can reduce our mana cost via convection. We can reduce our cast time via lightning mastery. We can increase our damage by concussion and increase our range by storm's reach. Now all of these are in the elemental tree, but we can also increase our critical strike chance via the title mastery talent in restoration. Now, it's important to remember that Lightning Shield is, of course, a lightning spell, but none of these talents will affect it. Let's take a look at our first lightning spell, and our most commonly used one, Lightning Bolt. Now, this is a, of course, a nature spell, has a 30-yard range on Talented, which can increase to 40 yards with Storm's Reach, has a cast time of 1.5 to 3 seconds, and 3 seconds starts coming in at rank 4 and above, rank 4 and below, the cast times are smaller, and it deals nature damage on hit. One of the strengths of Lightning Bolt has a high damage output. Not as high as Chain Lightning, but still has a very high damage output and is a great spell to use in most circumstances. It has no cooldown and has a much higher DPME than Chain Lightning if you're using it on a single target. Now the weaknesses. Many mobs and bosses have nature resistance. This is one reason why elemental shamans are not great in raids, and the other reason because of the mana cost of the spells. And that leads us into our second weakness, that Lightning Bolt is mana expensive over time, and, that, and it must be heavily downranked in longer raid encounters. Finally, Lightning Bolt is very talent dependent. If you saw my shaman leveling video part 2, you'll see that if you take a shaman without any of the elemental talents, and you cast lightning spells, that is the slowest way to level. However, if you take these elemental talents, the ones I've showed in the previous slide, it is the fastest way to level. So that difference comes from the talents alone. Lightning Bolt itself is a powerful spell, but it becomes so much more powerful when you put talents into the elemental tree. Now, for the spell coefficient for Lightning Bolt, we would expect by theory, if we divide 3 by 3.5, which is, remember, 3.5 is the default cast speed or the reference cast speed in Vanilla WoW, we expect it at 86%, and we get something very close to 87%. So, your Lightning Bolt spells will get between 86 to 87% of your total spell power. Now, for something really strange. So you know Lightning Bolt ranks 1 through 3 are less than 3 seconds. 
So theory would dictate that if we take those cast speeds and divide by 3.5, we would get varying percentages. 1.5 seconds, you get about 43%, 2 seconds, you get 57%, and 2.5, she gets 71%. However, the data does not show that, we do not get that. So it seems like that 3.5 second reference, and then you're dividing cast speed by that, cast speed is only for max rank. Lower rank spells are penalized in some way, and they deviate from what we expect theory-wise. So Lightning Bolt rank 1 only gets 12%, Rank 2 gets 30%, rank 3 gets 54%. Keep that in mind when you're downranking during raid or PvP encounters that you're not getting the maximal impact of your spell power even when you take cast speed into account. Now, just to make sure this wonky spell coefficient thing didn't scale with rank, I also tested this with rank 4, which is the first 3 second lightning bolt cast, and it performs exactly as we expect. Theory-wise, 86% of your spell power goes to it at rank 4. So it would seem that you only get what you expect theory-wise if you go to the spell's maximum trainable cast time. Anything before that, it doesn't scale the way we would expect theory-wise. So keep that in mind when you're downranking any spell with any class in the game. I don't know what 100% this will also follow in other classes, but I'm expecting that it probably would. Okay, let's move on to Chain Lightning. This is also a nature spell, has a 30 yard range on Talented, has a 2.5 second cast time on Talented, and that remains for all ranks. And this deals nature damage at a range on hit, and then can jump up to two additional targets. Each of those jumps reduces the previous damage by 30%. It is important to remember that each jump of Chain Lightning has its own chance to crit. The crit chance of subsequent jumps has nothing to do with if the first hit actually crit. Just keep that in mind. Now the first strength of this spell is that it has the highest DPME if it hits three targets. If it doesn't, you're kind of losing out on that mana expenditure. It has very high burst potential. Chain Lightning crits can really, really decimate a PvP team or can really have a high impact in DPS. It has great combo potential with Lightning Bolt and Shock. So if you cast Lightning Bolt, which has a travel time, Chain Lightning does not have a travel time, so you can cast Lightning Bolt. While Lightning Bolt's going to your enemy and you have the reduced casting time, you can start casting Chain Lightning. They get hit at the same time, follow with it with a Shock of some kind for extreme burst DPS. That's why Elemental Shaman are feared in PvP Battlegrounds, because of their ability to perform high burst damage very quickly. The weaknesses are that it has a six second cooldown, so you can't just keep chain casting it. Just like Lightning Bolt, many mobs and bosses have nature resistance, and it's very talent dependent, just like Lightning Bolt. And finally, it is very mana expensive, even more mana expensive than Lightning Bolt. So you're not gonna use it in PVE scenarios, you're just gonna keep casting Lightning Bolt. And in PVP situations, just make sure you have enough mana to cast it, and then you can regen mana between skirmishes. Now the spell coefficient is just what we expect theory-wise. A 2.5 second cast should receive about 71% of your spell power, and with my tests, I got the same value. So let's move on to Lightning Shield. This is a self-cast buff. It also provides nature damage. It can be ranged or melee. So if a melee attacker hits you, it can hit them. If a ranged target hits you, it will also hit them. Its cast time is instant and lasts 10 minutes. And what it does is it inflicts static amount of nature damage to an attacker, melee or range, and this can only happen every three seconds or so. If someone is hitting you, hitting you, hitting you, all three charges of lightning shield won't go off. It happens every two to three seconds. Now the damage of lightning shield can be increased via improved lightning shield talent, which is in the enhancement tree, but it can also be increased via spell power. And just remember that lightning shield cannot critically strike. The first strength of lightning shield is that it has a high DPME. It is actually more efficient than flame shock. It may produce less total damage, if it's untalented, but it does have a higher DPME. A really cool thing about Lightning Shield is that it's the only Shaman ability in the game that you can proactively store damage. It's very unique in that way. You click it, you put it on yourself, you can start regenerating mana walking through the world, and that essentially can make it even more mana efficient. Let's say you are you just killed a mob, you're near full mana, you put Lightning Shield on, and as you're walking to the next mob, you get back up to full capped mana. That spell was just free. So you can think of it that way too, it's, it's a way to proactively store damage. And lastly, it's an instant cast with no cooldown, which is really, really nice. You can keep refreshing it over a fight. I don't recommend it since it's not very mana efficient, but you can do it. There are two big weaknesses to Lightning Shield. And the first is just like all the Lightning spells, many bosses and mobs have nature resistance. And secondly, you have to be hit for that damage to go out. If you're in a raid setting and you're not being targeted and there's not a lot of damage going out, it's not gonna tick very often. The same thing can be said in dungeons. If you're shaman DPSing in dungeons, most of the damage will be taken by the tank, so Lightning Shield is not a regular source of DPS. For spell coefficient, Lightning Shield receives 33% of your total spell power, and that's for each orb. So each orb receives 33% of your spell power. So let's now move on to the healing spells. We've covered Lightning, let's talk about the healing spells. These are also integral parts of the Shaman Toolkit. 
so shaman heals except for healing stream totem are nature based healing stream totem is actually a frost based spell so if you're silenced while casting one of your healing spells you'll likely be locked out of other nature based spells depending on the type of silence that's being put on you healing can be increased via spell power plus healing gear and or talents and critical strike chance is also spell based and it can be increased via intellect spell crit healing crit and talents it's important to remember that healing stream totem cannot critically heal and while we're on the topic chain heal is the most used healing spell you'll use in end game pve situations as a shaman so make sure you know chain heal you love chain heal because everyone else does these four talents will increase the effectiveness and or efficacy of your healing spells not healing stream totem but your healing spells if you want to reduce threat, Healing Grace can reduce it by up to 15%. Mana cost can be reduced via Tidal Focus. Critical Strike Chance can be increased via Tidal Mastery. And Healing Power can be increased via Purification. These are all in the Restoration Tree. In addition to these talents, Healing Wave also has talents that specifically increase its power. Well then, let's get right into Healing Wave. So Healing Wave is a nature-based heal, has a 40 yard range, has a 1.5 to 3 second cast time, just like Lightning Bolt, where the ranks below rank 4 have a shorter cast time. Rank 4 and above have a 3 second cast time. And this heals your target for a range of health, depending on the rank and your spell power. There are two talents that are Healing Wave specific that can reduce its cast time and also increase its power. Improved Healing Wave reduces the cast time of Healing Wave by 0.1 seconds with each rank up to 0.5 seconds, making it a 2.5 second cast at max rank. The other talent is Healing Way, which has a chance of increasing the effectiveness of your next Healing Wave on the target by 6%, and that can stack up to 3 times. If you put 3 points in the Healing Way, it's a guaranteed effect. So if you heal a target, subsequent healing wave spells will be increased on the target by 6%, and that will stack up to 3 times. You can get it up to 18%, and that buff lasts 15 seconds, and that can keep reapplying itself if you keep casting healing wave on the target. Some strength for healing waves that it's a very mana-efficient single-target heal. It is the Shaman's most mana-efficient single-target heal. And also, as we just covered, there are specific talents to improve its effectiveness. A weakness, however, is that it may be mana efficient for Shaman, but it's not as mana efficient as Priest and Druid single target heal, so just keep that in mind. Healing Wave Rank 10 is only attainable via AQ20 by either doing the raid itself or by buying the tablet from the auction house. And finally, the spell coefficient for a 3 second Healing Wave is exactly what we would think theoretically at 86%. So 86% of your plus healing or spell power goes towards healing wave. Now, just like lightning bolt, lower ranks of healing wave do not follow what we would think they would follow spell coefficient wise when we look at the lower ranks. So rank one is a 1.5 second cast. We should get 43% when we get 12. Rank two, we only get 27. And rank three, we only get 50%. These are lower than we would expect theoretically. It's the same thing we see in lightning bolt. And at healing wave rank four, which is the lowest three second healing wave, we get exactly what we expect at 86 percent so keep that in mind when you're down ranking healing wave let's now look at lesser healing wave which is a nature-based heal 40 yard range and has a, only a 1.5 second cast time so this is your fastest healing spell just like healing wave it heals for a range of health on the target on hit the two strengths are that it's a quick effective heal and it's good for fast fights and pvp skirmishes where you need to get out of heal very quickly and of course, the major weakness is that it's not as mana efficient as Healing Wave. Lesser Healing Wave, in theory, we expected to get 43% of your spell power or plus healing, and the test corroborate that with 42%, so it's very, very close. Moving on to Chain Heal, which is the Shaman's claim to fame. It is a nature-based heal, has a 40 yard range, and a 2.5 second cast time. So this is unique because it's just like Chain Lightning in that it heals for a range of health on hit on the primary target and then jumps to two subsequent targets of the same party or raid this is actually very bad wording from the tooltip in the raid setting it doesn't matter what party the targets are in as long as they are near each other and moreover chain heal is a smart heal in that it jumps to the targets that need the healing the most in other words the targets with the lowest health each heal is 50 percent less effective than the previous heal additionally each subsequent target has to be within 12.5 yards of each other so target 2 has to be within 12.5 yards of that target 1 and then target 3 has to be within 12.5 yards of that target 2. target 3 does not have to be in 12.5 yard range of target 1. that's very confusing but just make sure you understand that chain heal may be the only smart heal in the game but it requires a lot of mental mapping and understanding of placement in the raid itself also just keep in mind just like chain lightning each subsequent hit has its own chance to crit so the initial hit has nothing to 
do with subsequent crit chances. The strengths of Chain Heal are, number one, it's the only smart heal in the game, and it can break party lines, which is huge. The Priest AoE heal can only heal within its own party. Chain Heal can go outside of party. This is very, very unique, and it's very, very important. And finally, is an excellent multi-target healing spell. The only really weakness is that it's only a mana efficient if you're healing multiple targets. So make sure you're not using Chain Heal unless you need to heal multiple targets. It sounds pretty stupid to say that, but just don't use it if you're only healing one guy. At a 2.5 second cast, theory-wise, we expected to get about 71% of your total spell power, and in my tests, I achieved 72%, so very, very close to where we'd expect it to be. Finally, let's go over Healing Stream Totem. This is an oddball, then it's a Frost School Totem. It has a 20-yard range on Talented, has an instant cast time and no cooldown, and it has a one-minute duration. Now, this is an AoE static heal over time that is party-wide, and it ticks every two seconds. Now, the strengths are it's the most mana-efficient heal in all of Classic WoW, and even more mana-efficient in a party. If you're healing five targets in rank one, if the HP ME is 18 heal per mana. That is an order of magnitude higher than any other heal in the entire game. And this is great when there's consistent party-wide damage going out. However, the biggest weakness is, is that it's nowhere near as beneficial as mana spring totem, especially if you're in a healer or caster group. Those healers or casters want mana, not health. So it has its uses, but unfortunately it's really overshadowed by mana spring totem. It gets 2% of your plus healing or plus spell damage. And there are three talents which can increase its effectiveness. Restorative totems increase its effect by 25% at max rank. Totemic mastery increases its range from 20 to 30 yards, and Totemic Focus reduces the mana cost of this totem by 25% at max rank. Now let's move on to the fire totems. For these totems, I just provide the DPME and spell coefficients because I've already went into these totems in depth in my classic WoW Shaman Totem Guide. If you want to know more about these totems specifically, their strengths and weaknesses and when to use them, I highly recommend checking out that guide. Now fire totems scale with spell power and spell crit except Magma Totem, which cannot crit, so that's something to keep in mind. But all of the additional power that these totems can get are coming from your spell power and or your spell crit via intellect, so just keep that in mind. Now, Searing Totem has the highest DPME for a single target, and it's a single target dot, so it can only attack one target at a time. And its spell coefficient is 6.4%, so it receives approximately 6.4% of your plus spell power. Magma Totem receives 2.8% of your spell power, and its DPME is relatively low compared to Searing Totem, but remember, if you multiply the amount of targets you're attacking by those single target DPMEs, you'll get to understand how mana efficient can really be if you're attacking multiple targets. The same story goes for Fire Nova Totem. Those DPME values seem very, very low, in fact, they're the lowest on this table. However, the more targets you're attacking, the more mana efficient it becomes and it receives 8.3% of your total spell power, so it actually receives the most out of the Fire Totems. So while we're on the topic of totems, let's talk about some advanced totem mechanics that I did not cover in the Classic WoW Shaman Totem Guide. Now these are mechanics that are more min-maxi and something that most players maybe will not use, but they're very important to know and they're very interesting and they can really increase your skill as a shaman. So we're going to go over earthbind kiting, totem twisting, and some mana spring math. Let's first go over Earthbind Kiting. This is a process that was developed by Cargos in his Shaman Leveling Guide. If you haven't checked out that video, definitely check it out, it's a very good video. So what this does is, is that it limits the amount of damage you as a Shaman will take soloing in the world. Mob swing timers are usually much faster than yours, especially if you're using a two-handed weapon. Before we get any deeper, this is something that you're gonna use if you're only using two-handers, and it works the best with the slower the two-hander is. Let's look at this image right here. We have you as the shaman in the bottom of the image. We have your swing timer that hasn't started moving yet. We have an earthbind totem in the middle, and we have this boar that you're going to be attacking. So what's going to happen first is that you're going to engage the boar and get closer to him, and you'll notice that the earthbind debuff will show up on the boar itself. Step one is that you're going to trade hits with the boar. You're going to hit the boar, the boar is going to hit you, and your swing timer will start to fill up. And when that fills up all the way, you'll swing again. So think of it as a cooldown. So what you're going to do, as soon as you trade hits, you're going to strafe to your right or left doesn't matter but we're going to use right in this example and you're going to strafe to your right and let that swing timer start filling up the reason why you're strafing and not turning around is that you do not want to give the mob your back because if you give them your back you have the chance of receiving the dazed mechanic which will slow your movement speed as well so make sure you always have yourself facing the mob strafing not backpedaling or turning around Remember, the boar is moving 50% slower than you are, so you're going to move much faster and farther than it. When your swing timer reaches about 75% full, you're going to immediately strafe in the other direction towards the boar. So now this image is showing you strafing in the other direction, strafing towards the boar again, and you'll eventually hit the boar when your swing timer is at 100%, and you'll trade hit for hit again, and the swing timer will start counting up again. And then you're going to strafe in the other direction, and then you're going to rinse and repeat. 
what you're doing is you're strafing back and forth, trading hit for hit with that boar, so you're taking much less damage. Let's use an extreme example, and say your, your swing timer is at four seconds, and the boar's is at two. Normally, you would take a hit every two seconds from the boar, but now you're taking one every four seconds. You're literally cutting the damage you're taking in half. That's an extreme example, and it can go less than that, like maybe 30%, but still, what would it feel like in Cargoes' words to walk around with a buff saying that you take 30% to 50% less damage? That's huge. You're going to drink less, you're going to heal less, you're going to have to repair less. It has a lot of benefits. You are losing out on DPS because you're not using Strength of Earth Totem, but if you're worried about money, if you're worried about drinking, spending money on, on water, this may be a process you want to try. So definitely give it a shot. It works really well. It takes a little bit of time to get used to, timing-wise, but when that swing timer is out 75% off cooldown, you want to start strafing back towards the mob and then strafe right through them in the other direction and then start strafing back in the other direction. Just make sure you get yourself a really good swing timer add-on so you know exactly when your swings are going to be off cooldown so you can really maximize this technique. Okay, this cartoon here is basically showing every shaman in a raid group. You're probably going to be healing as a shaman, and if you're in the melee group, your melee DPS are going to maximize your DPS as, as much as they can. And Wind Fury is amazing, and that's most of the cases you're going to be dropping Wind Fury, Strength of Earth Totem to make sure that they have the highest DPS possible. But are you really doing the best you can? The answer is technically no. Wind Fury and Grace of Air Totem, which increases agility, which in turn can increase attack power and critical strike depending on what classes are in that group, can be used at the same time. And you're going to say, Melderon, but these are both Air Totems. How can I give both of these buffs at the same time? Well, let me explain how. It's kind of tricky, it's mana expensive, it has a lot of actions per minute, and I'll argue why Resto Shaman may not be the best Shaman to pull this off. It may be an Enhancement Shaman, which if you Enhancement Shamans out here who want to raid, if you can master this technique, you may get a raid spot. I'm not going to guarantee it, but you can make an argument. So listen up. You probably don't notice this a lot because you're getting Wind Fury from the Totem and you don't care about its duration because it immediately re it refreshes every six to seven seconds when the Totem technically pulses. However, if you've ever walked out of Wind Fury's range, you may see that you still have the buff for a while until it counts down. In actuality, the Wind Fury buff lasts 10 seconds and that just keeps getting refreshed over and over again as long as you're in the Totem's range and as long as the Totem is up. But if you drop Wind Fury Totem and then immediately drop another Air Totem, you'll notice that you'll still have Wind Fury and it'll still count down. Let's look at this chart. You have time going across the screen on the, the big green arrow. Okay, that's just time in general. And that time is broken up into one second segments by those white vertical lines, those small white vertical lines above the green arrow. So each interval between two white lines is one second. So at time equals zero, that's the time when this timeline starts, you're gonna drop Wind Fury Totem. Now all totems cause a global cooldown to elapse. So a 1.5 second global cooldown will elapse. As soon as that global cooldown elapses, you're gonna drop Grace of Air Totem. And what you'll immediately notice is that you'll have the Grace of Air Totem buff and the Wind Fury buff on your weapon will continue to tick down. So technically you're getting both buffs. You are getting both buffs. Now you have 8.5 seconds of overlap where you'll have Grace of Air and you'll have Wind Fury. Right before or at the moment that the Wind Fury buff goes off, you're going to put down Wind Fury Totem down again, reinitialize the 10 second buff, wait for the globe cooldown to elapse, and then put down Grace of Air. So you'll have 8.5 second intervals of a dual buff, followed by a 1.5 second where you'll only have Wind Fury, followed by another 8.5 second overlap where you have both buffs. This is called Totem Twisting. It can and will significantly increase the DPS of the melee group you're in. So really how beneficial can this be? In this chart here, you'll see for each class and each rank of Grace of Air Totem, how much crit, melee attack power, and range attack power you'll gain by having Grace of Air Totem down. Couple this with the Wind Fury proc and attack power bonus of those procs, and you can have some really significant increases in your DPS. Just looking at Grace of Air Totem rank three, you're gonna provide an extra almost 4% crit to warriors and 2.7 crit to rogues and an additional 77 attack power to rogues as well. And that's not even considering how you can also increase DPS of yourself, the shaman in that group, or perhaps you got some feral druid or even a hunter in there, which is kind of rare, but just I put them all in here just in case. So there's a lot of benefits of totem twisting, but there's a lot of things we need to talk about here. And the first thing I want to say is that you can also twist in Tranquil Air Totem instead of Grace of Air if you're having threat issues. But the big thing here is please make sure that the tank isn't getting the buff from Tranquil Air Totem. And this can be harder to do. In larger bosses, it won't be as hard since you're going to be farther away, but you got to really think, if I want to put Tranquil Air Totem down because I'm having some threat issues, it's kind of counterintuitive that you're putting Wind Fury Totem and Tranquil Air Totem down. This isn't something that you're going to use, but just realize there's other Air Totems you can weave in, not just Grace of Air, but you're going to use Grace of Air 99.999% of the time. So I'm arguing this is an excellent job for Enhancement Shamans, 
not rest their shamans. There's a few reasons why. Each cycle of dropping Wind Fury followed by Grace of Air is 500 to 560 mana per cycle untalented. Now it can be reduced to 400 or so-ish mana, but still that's a lot of mana every 10 seconds. And a healer, you're going to be doing other things as well. You're going to be healing, right? And this is takes away from your mana that you're going to use for healing. Also, maybe too many actions per minute for healers. You got to think about healing. You got to think about this totem twisting. It's a lot to think about. I think Enhancement Shaman are a much better pick here because they're not going to be doing any Thing, but mostly white hitting, maybe weaving in a shock now and again. But you're not going to be using Storm Strike because it takes up a debuff slot. You're not going to use Flame Shock either, so you may just want to throw in a shock, an Earth Shock, or a Frost Shock every once in a while. And since the bosses are immune to the Frost Shock debuff, it shouldn't be a problem. So mostly you're just going to be using Wind Fury Weapon on your weapon, praying for Flurry Procs, and just DPSing. So, if you have Nightfall, and you know how to Totem Twist, you can might be really, really get a raid spot here, is that you are providing that, that debuff. You may not be the best class to provide that debuff from, from Nightfall, but since you also can Totem Twist, you may be providing an increase in DPS as well. I would seriously consider, if you want to do this type of thing, to get yourself Nightfall and to really learn how to Totem Twist. You may want to consider using gear that have some Intellect or MP5 on them, and make sure you get these consumables that I've listed on this slide to really help you keep up the Totem Twisting during a long fight. The build I put on the right is the build I would personally use. You'll notice it does not have parry. It does not have storm strike. It just has things that are going to increase the effect of your totems and give you the chance to proc flurry and increase your single target two-hander DPS. So those are the most important things you'll need. In the restoration tree, you'll increase the mana efficiency and range of your totems. You'll get that extra 3% chance to hit and you'll reduce the threat of your healing spells as you're probably going to be also possibly giving out a healer or two every once in a while. I put a point in nature's swiftness because there may be a situation where like the healers are oom or they can't get to the tank and you could provide an instant cast heal in the tank. That could be something you might want to think about. You can also put that point in reincarnation to lower the cooldown of your Ankh. Just your choice, personal choice. I personally think nature's swiftness is better. The last thing we're going to talk about as far as advanced totem mechanics is breaking even with Manatai Totem. When you're soloing out in the world, Manatai Totem costs mana, but then it gives mana back, right? So you're spending mana to make mana. But how long do you have to stand near that totem to actually start benefiting? And it's actually 20 seconds regardless of rank. After 20 seconds, you'll actually start net gaining mana. Just something to keep in mind if you're out soloing in the world, don't put Mana Spring Totem down if you're not going to be engaging for 20 seconds or if you're going to move out of the totem's range because you're just wasting the totem at that point. Now in group settings, it doesn't matter because the group benefit of Mana Spring is huge. That's where we're going to use it most of the time. But in the world, really only put it down if you're going to be staying in one position for at least 20 seconds. So I want to thank some of the viewers of the last totem guide to bring this up. And I decided to make sure I talked about this in this guide as well. Now before we close, I want to talk about some shaman tidbits. And these are pieces of information either submitted by viewers, commenters of the YouTube videos, friends of the channel, or some sort of stuff that I just wanted to really kind of look at and provide some interesting information about some other shaman abilities. So the first thing we're talking about is Searing Totem Tagging, and this is provided by Egregious. He actually talked about this in the last video I put out. And, you know, when you're in the world and red mobs, so hated mobs, ones that attack you automatically, say you need to kill a certain kind of them, and you and your party are having a hard time because another party is clearing them out, and you, have, you want to tag them. Now, of course, Shaman have single target attacks, and they can tag multiple targets, but say you're pretty far away, you're tagging another mob, and then mobs behind you start actually respawning. Your Searing Totem can be an excellent kind of sentry, not sentry totem, but an extra sentry in tagging mobs. Once a mob starts to respawn, the Searing Totem will immediately start cooking up its attack and will attack a mob pretty quickly, therefore tagging it for you. Now, of course, that mob will attack the target and will attack the totem and destroy it, but you've effectively gained that tag and then it will come to you and start attacking you. So it's an excellent way to aggro snap, quote unquote, mobs that are respawning in the world. Next, I want to go over poison cleansing for blind removal. Something I did not talk about in the, in the totem guide, since rogues blind is a poison in vanilla wow keeping down poison cleansing totem when you're fighting in pvp scenarios especially when you're fighting rogues will severely limit the amount of time you're cc'd as a shaman because you the rogue will be able to blind you but then it'll fall right off because of poison cleansing so just make sure you keep that down and also magma totem is great for getting rogues out of stealth but so is stone claw totem and i actually tested this myself so stone claw actually produces a zero damage attack so that means is that it attacks the target causes an amount of threat but doesn't do any damage to them and that attack is actually enough to bring a rogue or a druid out of stealth and since stone claw is an earth totem and magma is a fire totem you can actually put down two totems that can effectively get stealthies out of stealth pair that with poison cleansing which is a water totem you can have an anti-rogue kit 
keep that in mind if you're a shaman that stone claw magma and poison cleansing are great especially when you're fighting stealthies rogues or druids so the last tip i want to talk about is ghost wolf form now ghost wolf form is really interesting you may know that you can white hit in ghost wolf form but you may not know that there's no attack power penalty no armor penalty meaning you can still mitigate damage you can block dodge and parry weapon enhancement and procs still work so wind fury weapon will still proc so are flame sung so will Frostbrand. and the attack power bonus from rock biter also also is there as well you can use on use items like the gnomish mind control cap the nanomatic projector trinkets anything that's on use you can actually use you can still skin or pick herbs and you can still equip items and gear if you're in a pinch, if you're running around the world, someone's running away from you, and you're trying to get them, or you know, I hate to say this, but gank lobies, <laughs> you can use Ghost Wolf form to actually do all those things. You can actually do a lot in Ghost Wolf form, probably more than you thought you could, and you don't have to get out of it. So just something to keep in mind. Now, something you can't do in Ghost Wolf form is you can't use any other abilities. So you can just white hit. So something very, very important to keep in mind. You can't mine, fish, or craft which make, kind of makes sense because you don't have thumbs. You can't use consumables. You can't drink potions, flask. You can't use those engineering grenades. You can't use bandages. So any consumables you cannot use. Another thing is that Ghost Wolf can be dispelled or purged off of you. So definitely keep that in mind. And the last thing is you cannot communicate with any NPCs. You can't pick up quests. You can't turn in quests. You can't vendor. You can't talk to a flight master. So you can't do any of those things. You can't talk to an auction house guy. You know what you can do in Ghost Wolf and know what you can't do. So just some tidbits, just some interesting information and tips for you guys that are thinking about leveling Shaman. I hope you learned something from this, from these tidbits. Finally, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of Shaman content out there for you. If you want to heal endgame, which most Shaman want to, you're doing yourself a disservice if you haven't read the Egregious Guide the Rest of Shaman. The Egregious goes over everything you need to know to be an effective Rest of Shaman. Orc Bit and Hamster Wheel have excellent Shaman guides on their channels. Cargos has an excellent Shaman leveling guide that I referred to in the past where he first talked about Earthbind Kiting. And I want to say a funny story is that, you know, the reason Earthbind Kiting actually came to be is because Cargos was in the shower one day. This is a true story. He'll probably kill me for saying this, but he was in the shower one day and he was thinking about shaman uh and uh he thought about earthbind kiting because you know warriors have hamstring cutting which is actually similar and he said i wonder if shaman can do that too so he actually runs to the computer in a towel calls me up on discord and says meldron can shaman earthbind kite and i'm like uh i think they can let's give it a shot and we actually you know he actually did it showed that it works i've actually corroborated it on other systems and it, it, it's something that's really viable and really cool so definitely check out that video and then I have a lot of uh, shaman content. I have, I have a shaman tanking guide. I have a restoration shaman leveling guide if you, want, if you want to level as resto. I have two shaman leveling guides. And finally, I have the shaman totem guide. So there's a lot out there for you guys to learn about and to discuss if you're a shaman. Just a wealth of information. So definitely check out these. All the links will be in the description for all these videos and guides. The data that I collected is available in a shareable spreadsheet that I will provide a link in the description, as are the slides, so they'll also be available as a link in the description for you to download or comment on. And timestamps will be available in a pinned comment below so you can come back at your leisure, or if you want to just learn about certain topics, you should just click on that and go to the right slide. Finally, I'd like to thank everyone for watching this video. If you like this type of content, leave a like below. If you're eager to see the other things that we're making on this channel, definitely leave a subscribe because there's a lot more guides coming, a lot more other videos. We have Dev Talks where we interview WoW content creators and enthusiasts, and we make other videos exploring different facets of classic WoW. You can follow Def Camp at twitch.tv slash devcamp. You can follow us on Discord and follow us on Twitter. Those links are in the description as well. And finally, you can listen to Def Talk on five different platforms. Spotify, Google Play, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and iTunes. And Def Talk, again, is our podcast that we produce usually once per week. We've been a little slow recently, so we're trying to get some of those out again. And finally, I've talked about this before. The Egregious Guide, the Rest of Shaman, Taladril's Basic Stat Guide, Taladril's Tanking and Threat Guide. All of these guides are actually available on ClassicWild.live. Make sure you check that website out as well. And a friend of the channel, Brandung Media, has actually started to design merchandise for us. He's designed new logos for Def Camp Melder on TV. If you're interested in buying a Def Camp Melder on TV t-shirt or hoodie, definitely check out Brandung Media's website for more information on that. And finally, I'd like to thank my patrons. Thank you all for supporting me and my brother throughout the last year. If it wasn't for you, videos like this would not be possible. And the quality of these videos would not be possible as well. So thank you all. If you're interested in becoming a patron, if you're watching this, you're interested in helping us out directly, there'll be a Patreon link in the description and at the end of the video as a clickable link. Thanks for watching, guys. Keep on keybinding and grinding. And as always, Peace, my shaman brothers and sisters. May the ancestors be with you.